Great, I think we can get started. Um, hi, my name is Michelle Isherwood. I'm secretary on the Phi Delta um, Foundation Board of Trustees. Um, I'm also a member of the Boston Alumni Chapter and Humphrey Chapter. Um, I'd like to welcome you all tonight. We have a great speaker tonight. Um, I'm really happy that you could join us. If uh, our speaker tonight is Dr. Brian K Cahill, he is, and our topic is memory basics and current practices for collecting eyewitness evidence. Um, Dr. Cahill comes to us as an, he's an associate instructional professor from the University of Florida with his expertise in social and cognitive psychology. So we welcome him tonight. If you have questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A section um, and we will get to them uh, either, depending on how it goes, um, in between or also um, at the end. So again, I'd like us, like you all to welcome Dr. Brian Cahill. Thank you so much, Dr. Cahill, for coming to visit us tonight and share some expertise. Well, thank you so much, Michelle, for having me. And welcome, everybody. Um, I'm very informal, so any questions you have, just feel free to, to put them in the Q&A, and, um, and I'll be happy to address them. I'm going to share my screen, because I have a, a PowerPoint slide, of course, as a professor. I've got a presentation to go through with you all. And then... Um, it's going to be interactive too, so hopefully you can um, play along at home. Um, and then I also have this, it's geared a little bit more toward, I would say more toward maybe the police side of things and a defense attorney side, but of course, everything I'm going to talk about too will apply for a state's attorney. Um, I do work with state's attorneys as well. Um, when they would ask me to testify, I haven't had one yet because they usually don't need me. Um, but Anything I talk about today would also be relevant, but I'm going to kind of take the side of, of police and, and defense attorney training more so because that's a little bit more relevant, right? So like Michelle said, I'm going to talk about some memory basics first. So bringing years worth of memory research into like 20 minutes or 10 minutes, something like that, just to give you a background there. And then we're going to focus on the current best practices for collecting eyewitness evidence, all right? So let's go start with some general characteristics of memory. So I'm gonna make this as, as fun as possible. And so there's some general themes that we have. One of them is that perception does not equal reality. So the way that we perceive the world around us is not necessarily how it actually exists. Um, our expectations also influence the processing of information. I'm gonna go through and give you examples of all these. Um, perception is more important than reality. And then lastly, not all that comes into view of our eyes is, is recorded in memory. And that probably is the most important one from an eyewitness perspective. All right, so to start off with, there's a couple different theories regarding how our color vision works. One of them is called the opponent process theory of vision. Basically, it states that we have a um, visual system that, that treats pairs of colors as opposing or antagonistic. So when my neurons are firing for red and red, I'm seeing the color red, like Michelle's shirt, um, green is being inhibited in my brain. So if I flip it, I'll see an after image of green and vice versa for blue and yellow. So if we excite one, we're going to inhibit the other. And then if I get rid of the excitement, I can create what's called an after image. And we're going to try this out. So at home, if you can, if, if you're in a darker room, the better. But I'm going to um, show you this um, American flag here. I want you to look at the, the circle there in the middle and try not to blink. Just try to stare at that. Right, so I took it away. Hopefully a lot of you saw the American flag, red, white, and um, um, blue flag. Um, we're gonna do another one. This one's a little bit more fun. So that little black dot in the middle there, I want you to stare at that again. Try not to blink. And if you have the darker you are in your room, the better it will, it will see on your end. All right, so for that one, it should have been, you should have saw color right off the bat, but then it goes back to black and white. So let's try it one more time. That one's a lot of fun. You can try to blink now to try to get rid of the, uh, the after image and stare at that black dot. Let me pull it away and we see color again. It goes to black and white. Pretty cool, huh? All right, so again, our perception does not equal reality. So much of what is going on around us every day is not visible to human beings. We're only able to see this very specific length of wavelength, um, visible wavelength. 
We don't see ultraviolet. We don't see x-rays, infrared, microwave, and radio frequency. Imagine if we could see all these things around us, how much more information our brain would have to encode and interpret, right? But we've developed to specifically just see this kind of wavelength for an evolutionary advantage. It allows us to survive, right? And another way of thinking of this is that perception of color is a psychological interpretation of different wavelengths. Color does not exist. So the blue jacket that I'm wearing, it, the jacket itself is not blue. It has a dye in it that the wavelength bounces differently off of it than off of my shirt or off of Michelle's shirt. So Michelle's shirt will generate the wavelength of red, which is about 700 nanometers, whereas the, the wavelength of blue light will be about 450. So all that is, is our perception of the different wavelengths is our perception of color. So here's another, uh, a classic philosophical question. If a tree falls in a forest and there's no living creature is around, does it make a sound, right? And we often might ask this question to generate debate, but interestingly enough, the answer here really is no, it does not make a sound because sound is a perception. And if there's no living being around to take those vibrations of molecules to interpret that as sound, and there is no sound. <clears throat> Just like if you ask the question, if there were no animals on earth, would it be dark at night, right? So our perception of light and dark is our brain's way of interpreting different wavelengths. And, and it's, it's allowed us to survive. Again, we've evolved in a way to process information to allow us to survive, not necessarily to allow us to interpret the world as it accurately is. Just like, what is it like to be a bat? A bat's perception of the world is very much different from your and I's perception, right? <clears throat> I'm not going to play this one for y'all, but I uh, it's have it in the slide and I'm going to give the slides to Michelle and she can distribute them to y'all. Um, but I'm sure you saw this at one point. It was a big hit, Yanni versus Laurel. And you can play the same audio clip back. And depending upon different characteristics, you'll either hear Yanni or you hear Laurel um, very clearly. And it looks like maybe some of you haven't seen this. So let me, let me go ahead and play it. It's actually really fun. I didn't want to, but I can't resist. <clears throat> Laurel, 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 Laurel. I don't know about you, but all I hear is Laurel, but many of you out there, I'm sure, are hearing Yanni, right? Some of it has to do with the frequency of it and, and, and different things, um, but the point is, from our perspective, as a, as a witness's perspective, is that you can have two people witness something and come to completely different conclusions based upon what they saw, which is important from a witness's perspective because we want to believe that when a witness says they saw this, we want to trust them. And we use different characteristics to try to um, determine the veracity of that statement, maybe confidence and, and whatnot, right? And their viewing conditions. But Importantly, just because someone says they saw something or heard something doesn't necessarily mean that that was accurate. They could have misheard it. They could have stored it wrong and so forth. And we're going to cover some more of these topics later on. But we don't perceive the world as, as accurately as we, as we want to believe. You also probably saw the blue dress or the white and gold dress phenomenon that hit the internet a few years ago. Same kind of thing there. You both look at a dress and one of you believes that that's, that's black and blue. Uh, others believe it is gold and white, right? But it's the same dress. Again, it's depending upon the um, lighting in the picture and how your brain interprets the lighting and where to put shade and whatnot. Okay. <clears throat> so again, as I've stated, our brains are hardwired to maximize survival, reproductive value, not to perceive the world accurately. But what's cool for us is how we misperceive the world tells us how the brain is set up and that we can, we can put people in experiments and, and basically put them in situations that we know they're gonna fail to show how our brain is hardwired, right? And then we can use that information to generalize to the real world to, to understand how we process information and to know which situations might lead to more mis, um, misperception than, than others. What situations will lead to less accuracy or more accuracy? So let me ask you all here kind of just briefly, uh, um, do you think these lines are the same length or different lengths? I'll let you kind of answer them on your own. You don't have to put it in the chat. Most of you are going to say they're, they're different lengths. Um, or if you've seen this before, you might know that they're the same length, actually. Okay. 
So here's another one. If you were to walk from A to B and then walk from C to D, would it be longer, shorter, or the same distance? So I'll give you all a, a couple minutes or a minute to, to answer that one too. So if I walk from A to B and then from C to D, would it be longer, shorter, or the same distance or the same time, I guess? Okay. <clears throat> all right. The answer is the same. Those lines are both the same. But again, how our brain has evolved to perceive um, lines and, and, and orientation affects our answer for that. So here again, are these tables the same width and length or are they different width and length? Usually people think the one on the left is different from the one on the right, but if we take it and outline it and then move it, move it over, we can see that it's the exact same. Again, orientation changes our perception of size. So let me say here, so I do want people to answer here. So if you can in the chat answer, um, are these the same or are they different links? I wanna see what people say. But we get same or different. I only see Michelle's. I guess there's other people. So can I not see anybody else's response, Michelle, or is just no one's answering? I'm not seeing anyone else's response. Okay. <clears throat> I see more response in there. Oh, the responses oh, are in the Q&A. &A. Okay. <laughs> different, different, same, same. Okay. So uh, I tricked you all here on this one, right? So of course these are different. There's no way in hell these two lines are the same, right? But what did I just do? I just went through demonstration, through demonstration showing you how all of them are the same. So now when I present you with something that's obviously um, different lengths of lines, you use your previous experience the last couple minutes to change your answer. Even though I bet you, you wanted to say different, you didn't want to get tricked again, okay? <clears throat> but obviously these are different linked lines, okay? So this brings us to theme two, that our expectations influence the processing of information. This is really important. So how we view the world and our biases and stereotypes and everything that we bring into the situation affect how we um, how we view that information and how we take it in and, and perceive it. A classic example of this is there was a study years ago, I'm blanking on the name, but it was of a Princeton football game. And they had people who are Princeton football fans watch the game and then the other team um, watch the game. And they basically asked people the, the same questions like, do you agree on the penalties and things like that? And I don't remember the exact specific results of the experiment other than what we showed was that people who were Princeton fans thought that the fouls were good when they were on Princeton side, but they were bad when they were on the other side and vice versa. So our biases that I like my team, I'm going to agree with fouls that are um, beneficial to my team. And I'm going to disagree when they're not beneficial for my team, again, plays in this role of that our previous experiences affect how we interpret the world. Okay. So here's a, a kind of a vague image. If I present this image after Easter, more people will say that's a bunny rabbit. If I present it at other times, people are often going to say it's a duck. Again, our previous experiences are going to affect how we perceive the world. Part of this is driven by some really cool processes that our brain has developed called top-down and bottom-up processing. This is really freaking cool. Sorry if I get excited, but this is amazing what our brain can do. So top-down processing is when we process information using pre-existing knowledge and expectations to bear upon the perception. So imagine if you're a, a, a soda machine and I put a dollar bill into the soda machine, but it's upside down, okay? If I have top-down processing, I'm going to infer that it's still a dollar bill because I can, I can determine it from the shape of it and the back of it and all that kind of stuff, okay? Even if it's bent a little bit and whatnot. But if I only had bottom-up processing, which is when I process information via the, the individual sensation, the, the individual stimulus features that make up the, the, the form, um, I would reject that dollar bill because it has to be presented to me in the way that I was programmed to read it, okay? What's so cool about this is that top-down processing allows us to process things very quickly and efficiently um, that are incomplete um, 
that, that we don't need all the information to do so. And a really great demonstration is here. So read the sentence, the paragraph here to yourself. So how freaking cool is that? that you can read that pretty much um, without error. It slowed down a little bit, but you're still able to read that and understand all of that gibberish just because everything in the middle is the same and the end and beginning letters are, are correct. Your top-down processing is allowing you to overcome that. Um, if you only had bottom-up processing, you couldn't read any of this. And that's really freaking cool that our brain can basically fix that. That's why we make we make a lot of errors in spelling. Right. If we don't use spell check, because when we're reading or proofreading, our brain is fixing the mistakes for us. So I always tell my students, write something, take a break and then come back and read it. Don't write something and then read it on the spot because your top down processing is going to, you know what you're trying to say in your head. And so it's going to come out really clear when you read it. But if you take a break and come back an hour later, you may say, oh, my God, what the hell was I writing here? I have no idea what I was trying to explain because your top down processing doesn't remember what you're trying to do. So it's a, it's a good technique to use when you're writing. Another example of top-down processing here is that we might give people these symbols here. And then when I ask you right now, you can't distinguish between them being an A or an H. But if I put them in between the letters T and E for the first one, and the last one, a C and a T, you now say the first symbol is, a, is an H for the, and the latter symbol is an A for um, cat. So the cat. And if we put those in the context, now all of a sudden your brain can interpret it using um, your top-down processing. All right, so perception depends upon expectations, right? This is what I just talked about here with the cat. Um, here's some other cool videos. I'm going to skip those. Um, but I have another really cool video that I definitely want to watch in a second here. Third theme, perceptions are more important than reality. Again, it doesn't really matter what the world um, actually um, how the world is viewed um, accurately. It's how we perceive the world that's more important. Um, and then again, not all that comes into our view of our eyes is recorded in memory. We've all seen a penny thousands of times. So I'm going to give you a penny lineup and see if you can pick out the penny. So again, if you can answer here, anybody want to try to guess what the real penny is? Let me just give us the answer. So it's, it's not B and it's not F and it's not I. David uh, Servant, it is A, correct. So A is the real penny, okay? <clears throat> we can do this with other stimuli too. Apple, I'm assuming many of you have seen the Apple symbol. Um, again here, we don't need to go through it, but it is B here is the answer. Um, even though we've seen this a lot of times, it's really hard to identify these things in a lineup because we're not, we're not used to seeing them um, manipulated in, in subtle ways to be able to tell the difference because not everything that we view comes into memory. All right, so here's a really cool video I want us to watch um, from my favorite called Who Done It? Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to give you a tip. Things are going to change in the video. So I want you to watch the video. And I want you to see if you notice anything change in the video. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. What? What? How did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. Why not? It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? Okay, so this is perfect because this is a, like an eyewitness situation. You all watch the, uh, a scene, all right? And you imagine you're a witness and you have to describe to the police what happened. 
you might be good at the central details of what happened, who was there and things like that. But there are lots of things that are going on in the peripheral that our previous expectations tell us don't change. Top-down processing tell us that pieces of artwork on the wall aren't going to change out of nowhere, right? Things like that. So we're not going to be good at noticing these changes. So let's go through and see all the changes and how they did. It's really cool to, to, for them to see this. Uh, Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. But I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. So again, even, even though some of the features were minor there, we also had some pretty essential details change in front of us, and we may not have recognized all of them, right? So it's really cool demonstration to show that not everything that we view is, is um, encoded into memory, right? <clears throat> okay. This is an awareness test. Oh. Hold on, sorry. How many passes does the team in white make? No! Sorry about that. Um, so now let's um, get into some of the basics of memory. So that's kind of our perception and how memory works. And let's just get at some of the main components, right? So uh, there's generally kind of three stages of memory. It can be more complicated than this, but this is a classic breakdown. There's encoding stage, the storage and retrieval, okay? Uh, the encoding stage in the, in the case of a, of a eyewitness situation would be the crime occurring and a witness viewing or victim viewing the event being present at the event. Then, taking that information that they that they have encoded and storing that that's the storage phase obviously and then anytime they're asked to access that information whether it's on their own recalling the event or being interviewed by the police or lawyers um, that would be the retrieval stage of the event okay and there's two kind of broad types of memory that are, are going to be relevant here um, recall and recognition recall is when we access memory um, when there's no specific memory cue being provided. So we might do something like, please tell me what happened during the robbery. That would be a, rec uh, a recall task. So we're asking the witness or victim to tell me as much as they can remember about the event, right? As opposed to recognition, where we're going to give them a memory cue of some form and say, do you recognize this? Have you seen this before? Yes or no kind of thing. This is more specifically a lineup it is what we do with a lineup task. So is this face familiar to me? Do you recognize this face? Okay. <clears throat> and we can make errors during any one of these stages. So memory can it is, is faulty. Um, memory is definitely not as, as, as accurate as once was thought. There's lots of ways that we can impair memory. As one of my colleagues um, um, mentioned famously, that memory is more, uh, Dr. Beth Loftus, memory is more like a Wikipedia page that not only can I go in and edit my own memories, but so can other people. So um, you need to be careful about how you access, how you encode, and how you store memories because it can taint those memories. Memory traces deteriorate over time. We've known that for a very long time. Ebbinghaus showed this years and years ago, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. And retrieval of information involves reconstructive process. We don't simply go in and pull out a memory, um, like a DVD player or, or uh, an MP3 file or whatnot. We, we use our previous experiences and our, our schemas and different things to reconstruct what, what had happened, what likely happened. So if I ask Michelle, what were you doing three weeks ago on this day? You probably can't remember, Michelle, exactly what you're doing, but you might go back and say, well, it's this day of the week, so it's a Tuesday. Um, so on Tuesdays, this time I'm usually doing this. So maybe that's what I did. And a lot of people may do that when they're being interrogated and now, mistakenly, a lot of times, maybe they provide a false alibi. And now they get the police suspecting that they're guilty and, and the interrogation heats up and they, they, they pinpoint on them more. So um, it's really important how we go about accessing and, and retrieving this information. 
Um, so now more specifically to a lineup. So why do we give a lineup? Um, a lot of people think the purpose of a lineup is to test the memory of a witness. And that's really not the purpose of a lineup. Um, if we wanted to test the memory of a lineup, we would typically do so when there's rock solid evidence against a person. Maybe we have DNA that they're the, that they're, um, the culprit. Then we, if we wanted to test the memory's witness or the, the, the uh, witness of the memory, um, uh, we would do so at that point because we could tell whether or not they're accurate. Because if they pick the person we know is guilty, then they're showing us that their memory is accurate. But that's not when we do a lineup. We're really doing a lineup to test if the suspect is the criminal. The police have a hypothesis that this person is guilty of the crime. And in order to test that hypothesis, we conduct a lineup. And why is this important? It's important because with the data below, you can see that if I ask the question one way, um, which is testing the memory. So what is the likelihood that the witness will identify the suspect if I show them the suspect, okay? That's testing the memory of the witness. Um, that's what we call the frequentist approach. And that's what we typically do in research. What's the likelihood that the witness says that it's the president if we show them the president, okay? And that would be here, um, 14 divided by 20 would be that answer. Okay? I think that's 70% um, accuracy, okay? So whenever I showed them the president 14 times out of 20, they said it was the president, right? From a from a applied perspective, though, in the in the criminal world, that's not what we care about in the forensic world. What we really care about is given that the witness said that it was the president, what was the likelihood that they were correct, that they were a president? This information is in that top row of 14 out of 17, which is about 80 something percent. So with the same data, if I ask the question in a different way, I get very different answers, very uh, significant different answers. And it's meaningful to pose the question in that way. So when you think of lineups from now on, I want you to think of them in terms of, we're trying to gain evidence, either that the person is guilty or that the person is innocent. And we need to update our belief in that based upon the lineup. And if the lineup is done properly and the witness was questioned properly and they had good memory and whatnot, then we can use their answer in the lineup to update that belief. If we violate the procedures in the ways I'm gonna talk about today, then we don't really learn anything from the witness based upon their identification because it's been tainted by the way that we've gathered it or the way that we interviewed them, okay? <clears throat> um, we can see here, I'm just gonna briefly talk about the, the reason why we should study um, uh, memory and eyewitness memory. It's overwhelmingly the most common cause of wrongful convictions. Um, you can see here in a, in a sample of 40 cases of DNA exoneration, victim ID, victim ID, witness ID, two victim IDs, police ID, over and over and over again, you see the contributing factor of wrongful identification. So it's clearly an area that we need to understand to help reduce errors in the justice system. And think of it like this. Not only do we want to prevent someone innocent from going to jail, we also want to catch the real culprit, right? So anytime that we make a wrongful identification, we make two errors. The guilty party goes free and the innocent person goes to jail. So by default, we don't want false positives. We want, we'd rather have false misses. We'd rather have the culprit go away to some, to, to some extent, um, depending on the argument you want to take. But I would take that argument that we care more about false positives and false misses because when the false miss occurs, we're only committing one error. The innocent per or the guilty party is going free. Okay. So we definitely want to understand this in more detail, right? <clears throat> we also know, and, and I'm sure you're all familiar with this, that it's very compelling evidence in court. When a, when a witness takes a stand or a victim takes a stand and points over to the defendant and says, that's the man that raped me, or that's the man that shot my, my boyfriend, um, it's very persuasive to a jury, especially when they do so with high confidence and they're passionate and whatnot. And we also have to understand that witnesses, by and large, are not lying when they take the stand and they identify someone. Most of them are not consciously lying to the jury or to the, to the state or police or judge or whatnot. They truly believe that that's the person that committed the crime. But it doesn't mean that they're right just because they believe that. And we're gonna talk more about why that is in a second, okay? There's two major Supreme Court cases that um, have been, uh, um, ex and have examined eyewitness evidence, specifically Neil V. Biggers, and Manson Braithwaite, um, 
basically they outline these kind of five ways to determine whether a witness is credible or not. Um, the major problem with these is that several of these are, it, it's hard to assess the reliability of these because we have to rely on self-report. So opportunity to view, um, level of attention, and degree of certainty are all variables that we have to rely upon asking a witness to self-report. And they're not, we are not good as people at estimating how good of a view we got for, to a large extent, especially under stressful situations, how much attention we paid, or the degree of certainty. A lot of factors can affect confidence statements other than the accuracy of the statement. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. We can objectively verify the accuracy of the description. So the witness gives a description and then we get a suspect. We can compare the two and see how well they match. Um, and then we can also tell the time between witnessing and the identification. So research does show that as more time goes on between the ID and the, and the encoding of the event, accuracy rates um, or, or the, ac the um, accuracy of the identifications go down, particularly from a week, um, from anything over a week. It kind of plateaus out over a week, but we really want to get an ID in be, um, before a week time frame or a retention interval. Okay? But again, the problem with these criteria, it's not that these things are not related to eyewitness accuracy. They, a lot of them are. It's just that in order to accurately assess them, we have to rely on self-report, and that's a problem. And so while these are good safeguards to have to way to assess credibility, um, they're not useful because we're not able to accurately assess them in court often. Okay. Other ways that we have to, to as safeguards in the legal system to expose eyewitness bias include um, determining the witness's ability to observe, which we just talked about, voir dire. We can question jurors through voir dire to determine whether or not they understand how memory works and things like that. Um, we can file a motion to suppress. In Florida, at least, um, this is a problem specifically because it's a two-prong approach, right? The first problem, did, did law enforcement do anything to taint the ID? That one's pretty easy to meet, in my experience, most of the time. The second prong, however, though, is really hard to meet from a defense's perspective because we must prove that the officer's actions are the only reason the identification would have happened. And that's really hard to, to satisfy. Um, so it almost makes it impossible in, in a lot of cases to over to, to get to get a motion to suppress. Um, obviously, I can come in and testify in court or someone with my credentials can come testify about the issues. Um, you can use cross-examination to reduce the credibility of the witness. Um, we can give juror instructions and then jury deliberation. But at the end of the day, it, it's still hard because witnesses are very influential and jurors want to believe witnesses. So it's hard to overcome a lot of these um, safeguards, which is why we need to collect the evidence in a proper way to begin with. Okay. So now I'm, I'm at that point. I think now Michelle might be a, a good time to kind of ask some questions about what I've covered so far before we jump into the lineup stuff, or if people just want me to continue, I can continue, but I know I just covered a lot there. So if, if anybody had questions so far, I'm happy to answer them. I do have one question in the chat or in the Q&A. If anyone yep. else has questions, please put them in the Q&A. Um, we have... It says, does the fact that a witness does not recall everything perfectly establish witness credibility? That's a really good question. Just because they are inconsistent with their, um, with their statement doesn't mean that they're not accurate. That's a very complex question. Um, there's kind of different ways. I, I, I have to read up on the literature a little bit more on that one. But for instance, um, way memory works is that we reminisce. So I'm not always going to recall everything perfectly every time I recall an event. I'm going to, if I'm, if I'm trying really hard, I'm going to end up adding details as I recall it. Um, if I contradict myself though, like for instance, if I say the, the shooter was, um, the shooter was in a car driving at me, but then in a later story, I say that the shooter was in the car driving away from me, those contradictions like that typically mean that the witness is not accurate because you can't have that. You can't have direct contradictions because one, one account has to be accurate, right? That either the shooter was going away from me or they were coming toward me. Both can't be right. But if I add detail to it, um, like, oh, I forgot. Once they shot at me, they also did this. That doesn't necessarily mean that they were inaccurate with what they said before. Does that answer your question? 
And then I have another question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I have another question too. Um, Has the utilization of trauma informed care slash practice been implemented through your experience? I'm not sure. I'm not, um, I'm not a clinical person, so I don't, I don't deal with that kind of stuff. I'm happy to pass that question along to some colleagues and I can get back to you on that. So if you want to save that question, who asked that, Michelle, I'm happy to, to follow up with them. Okay. Uh, but I, I don't know the clinical side of stuff. I'm a, I'm a eyewitness person and, and, and memory mainly. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry, I can't answer that one. Um, the first person says, yes, you did answer their question. Okay, good, good. Okay. Um, there's two more questions, but they're basically based on the slide. So um, okay. we'll go ahead and if if they still have questions after you okay. address the slide, we'll go. Okay, sounds good. So recently, Wells um, and and my co- and some other colleagues of mine um, got together and re- um, updated our what we call a white paper, which is our based upon all the collected empirical evidence in our field. What are what does the data say? What's the best way to collect eyewitness evidence? And from that data, we came up with nine recommendations um, listed on the left that police should follow. And if you follow these recommendations, it will increase the reliability of the data you collect, okay? Violating these will obviously decrease the reliability of it. Um, So I'm gonna go through each one of these uh, as we go forward. And if you have questions as I go, happy to answer them or we can wait till the end, Um, but I'll I'll get through these. So the first one is a pre-lineup interview. So this is really important because the, you need to collect the evidence in an untainted fashion to begin with. Once you introduce leading or suggesting questions, it can taint the memory. And once you taint the memory, you can no longer unring the bell. You can't untangle the, the false memory from the real memory. It's very, very difficult, if, at all, if, if impossible, to do that. So you always want to make sure you gather evidence accurately to begin with. So prior to conducting any identification procedure, the police should be clear Um, have a clear record of the eyewitness's description of the culprit. Um, Record that word for word verbatim what they're describing. The viewing conditions, attention during the crime, and any claims of prior familiarity with the culprit. They should hopefully, if they can, record all this so I can listen to it uh, or uh, the the lawyer representing the client or the the expert can listen to this information as well. Um, But definitely ask as many open-ended questions as possible refrain from asking leading questions. So ask things like, can you please tell me everything you remember about the robbery? If you have a suspect or if you heard from some other witness that they were wearing a black hat, don't say the culprit was, the the robber was wearing a hat, right? That's a leading question that that witness has never talked about a hat. You don't want to give them that information because now they may take that into their memorial report and, and report that from now on. And now we don't know if they actually viewed that and encoded it or they got that information from, from the police. Okay. The second one, this is probably the most complex one because we have to do some math. So bear with me on this one. But basically, this recommendation, which I would argue is maybe the most important one that we have, because you can't be wrongfully ID'd if you're not in the lineup to begin with. So if we can reduce putting innocent people in lineups to begin with, we will get rid of a lot of false identifications. And how can we do that? We can do that by stop putting people into lineups without reasonable suspicion. Police too often say, oh, I got a hunch that this guy is a guilty party, or they run the MO and they find out there's someone in the area that lives there who's been arrested for similar burglaries before. And they say, oh, then maybe this is a guy and they throw him in a lineup without any evidence that he committed this specific crime. And the only study to estimate actual base rates, we found that 35% of the lineups actually had the real culprit in it. That's not a good percentage. Okay? I mean, 65% of the time, the real culprit was not included in the lineup presented to witnesses. Um, the reason why they gave for, for putting people in the lineup, police often put them in without evidence. Um, 40% of the time, they had no evidence at all. 30% they had minimal evidence, like they matched a very vague description or had been convicted before of a similar crime or something like that. Base rates are important, um, and I'm I'm not going to go fully into them, but but the basic idea here is that think of a prostate exam. This is a great example that my colleagues provide, right? Prostate exam for a man over 50 and under 30, the accuracy of the test is exactly the same. 
However, any man under 30 who gets a positive result from a prostate exam, it's almost for sure a false positive because the rate, the base rate of having prostate cancer for men under 30 is so low that it basically is non-existent. So if, if you if you have a test and it says you have prostate cancer and you're under 30, it's almost guaranteed to be a false positive. Just like if I went to the doctor and I had a cough and a fever and the doctor says, oh my gosh, I think you have Ebola. And I would say, you know, the base rate of me having Ebola is so low that there's basically no way of me having Ebola um, because the base rate is so low, just because I have, I match these gen generic um, uh, um, uh, symptoms that, that also match with Ebola. However, if I recently came back from a, a, a country over in Africa that recently has an outbreak from Ebola, now my base rate goes way up. And now that information makes it more likely that I might actually be a true positive for having that, right? So base rates are important, right? And we can take an example, which my, my colleagues outline, um, and we're just gonna walk through this real quick. Basically, what we can do is we take a thousand witnesses and we have a hit rate, meaning they identify the target 60% of the time, or a false ID rate, where they identify the, the, the innocent suspect 6% of the time, okay? If I make the, the base rate 50%, so 50% of the labs have a, a target in them, 50% do not, so 500 or 500. I take 60% times 500, I get 300 guilty IDs, I get 30 false IDs, and we can see that the, the innocent ID rate is 9.1%, okay? Look what happens when I drop that 20%, the base rate. I double or more than double the innocent ID rate. Okay. And keep in mind, the most important part here is that the witness's accuracy level is the same. I haven't changed that at all. All I did was change the base rate, the, the entering probability that the person is guilty or not. Okay. When I up it to 70%, look, I cut the false ID rate nearly in half or more, more than half, right? So base rates are really important. So what we need is to stop putting people in the lineups unless we have reasonable suspicion, right? Another way to think of this too is that target absent labs are bad other than just leading to false IDs because what research shows is that target absent lineups increase filler selections. And if you've ever had a client, a witness, if you're a state's attorney, you've ever had a witness who identified a filler from a lineup, that's bad for you, right? Because that reduces their credibility. We don't want that. So we don't want to show witnesses lineups unless we're pretty sure or have reason to suspect that that person's guilty because we don't want to risk that witness losing their credibility, identifying a filler, okay? So what do we mean by reasonable suspicion? Just like, I often get asked this a lot by, by state's attorneys, just like reasonable, um, uh, reasonable doubt or probable cause, there's not a specific um, number that we're going to uh, attach to this, right? And in any given case, I can't come up and say, in this specific case, here's the a priori base rate. And then with this updated information, here's the posterior probability. It, there's too many factors involved. I can't say that. But um, nonetheless, it's still an important concept, just like reasonable doubt is and just like probable cause is, that we can use our logic to determine whether we have reasonable suspicion. So what we mean is that there's articulable evidence that leads to a reasonable inference that a particular person, to the exclusion of others or most others, likely committed the crime in question. Basically, it's not a mere hunch. It doesn't fit a general description or some post hoc reasoning. Okay. Some other examples that they give in the white paper are here. I won't, I won't bemoan us with going through each of these, but um, you know, a, a witness or a, a suspect makes some self-incriminating statements, or the police stop somebody in the vicinity and they match the general description. They have a unique um a descriptor, they have a specific tattoo that matches the description, or they they stop somebody and they're able to search them. And then when they search them, they find evidence that was um, matches the, the property that was stolen. These are things that would that would lead to reasonable suspicion, okay? We basically don't want cops putting people in the lab just because they have a hunch. I work too many cases where the description might be white male with blue jeans and, and, and uh, brown hair. And the cops stop somebody and throw him in a lineup and it's like, that that's so vague how many other men in the area match that description way too many that's not enough to put them in a lineup in in my opinion okay all right number three blind lineup administration um so florida we recently passed a law where we have to do this in the state of florida 
Um, I know we have people from all over the country, so states are going to vary on this. Um, but basically what we want here is that the person administering the lineup does not know who the suspect is. Um, this reduces unintentional communication cues from the, from the administrator leaking to the witness to um, cue them into who we want them to pick. Okay. Um, in my experience, prior to this law being enacted, this was rarely followed, even though this has been a recommendation for decades. It's a basic tenet of research that research should be double blind. Um, when I conduct a study, I don't tell my participants what my hypotheses are, and I don't tell the RAs who are running the experiment what the um, uh, hypotheses are and which groups are running because I don't want them to influence each other. Okay. Um, research shows pretty clearly that single blind administration of lineups increases the likelihood that witnesses will identify the suspect, irrespective of whether the suspect is a culprit or an innocent suspect. Um, it also can lead to changing how witnesses and or how administrators interpret statements that the witness makes during the lineup. So maybe the witness says something like, you know, I, I, it looks like him. Um, that if you pay attention is not an identification, right? They're not identifying that person as the culprit, but they're saying it looks like him, but someone who's not blind might, the administrator might interpret that as a lineup identification and say, okay, good job. Or, or say something like, you know, how confident are you? And now the witness has now made a decision, even though they never really did. Now they're providing confidence on a statement that they never really made. So it's really bad to have um, non-blind administrators. And it's a really easy fix for police to do. They don't, they can either get another detective to administer the lineup, or you can do it automated um, to, to do the lineup. As long as the witness knows that the person giving them the lineup does not know who the witness, who the suspect is, and there's no way for them to, to transmit that information, then we, we consider that um, double blind. Okay. So here's a, a great lineup. I say great sarcastically, obviously. Um, so here the criminal was described as late teens, 15 to 16 years old, no more than 18. African-American, black male, small build, 120, 140 pounds in weight, between 5'2 and 5'5 five, five in height, long hair and some kind of braids, single row braids that were coming loose. So who do you think the witness is going to pick from this lineup? Obviously, it's going to be this poor kid here, right? Because he's the only one that remotely matches that description of this last descriptor. No one else has this, all right? So we would consider this what we call a biased lineup, okay? Here's my all-time favorite. I'll give you a, a second to look at this to see if you can figure out where the bias is in this lineup. <clears throat> so if you haven't seen it yet, look at number five and look at his lap and see where he, what he's doing with his fingers. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is a police officer in that department who is pointing to the suspect in the lineup for the witness to pick. And that's obviously not not okay, right? So in, in either case, what we want here with, with recommendation four is that our, our fillers should, we should have one suspect in every lineup, um, only one suspect, and at least five fillers <coughs> who make it so that the suspect does not stand out from the fillers. We don't want to create what we call a bias lineup, okay? Um, so how to select fillers. So match the suspect, how similar is similar enough. Um, some research shows that as similarity increases, correct IDs decrease. Think of it in terms of if I have six clones of each other, it's going to be really hard for the witness to pick the person out. So we may not want to go too similar. Okay? But if they're too dissimilar, now we're ending up with a bias lineup, so that's bad as well. Another method is called match to description. And here we take the witness's description and we pick the fillers based upon that. The problem here is that any of you that have worked real-life cases a lot of descriptions that people give are very generic. White male, blonde hair, um, a skinny. And that's all we have to go off of, right? Um, so they may the descriptions may not be very good. Or sometimes the descriptions are very specific. And they may say the, the, the uh, perpetrator had a mustache. But the picture that we have of the suspect does not have a mustache. So now what do we do? We can't, we can't use match description anymore. So we've got to kind of use a hybrid. Okay. Um, the jury still is really out in this area about which method is the best. What we can all agree on, though, is that we can kind of take a hybrid approach here. So basically, when you create your lineup, 
um, or if you're if you're hired to for a case where there's a lineup presented, look at the lineup and try to see does anybody stand out. Basically, does your does your client stand out compared to the other people in the lineup? You can even get random people, show them the lineup, and say, "Here's a general description. Tell me who the suspect is." And then if people are picking your client out at a higher rate than anybody else, and that might mean that the lineup is biased, and you could hire someone like me to do a more systematic review of it. Okay. Um, Fillers should match the general description provided by the witness, but there's exceptions to this. So one, if the suspect does not fit the descriptor, so they don't have a mustache, then you should omit that from matching um, for that descriptor. If the description is vague, general, or sparse, um, you can match the suspect on basic default characteristics, such as facial hair, hairstyle, and general body build. Okay? <clears throat> um, Best to conduct a mini mock witness paradigm, kind of what I just described. So you go around to people who don't know who the suspect is or anything, give them the general description that the witness provided and say, can you pick out who the who the suspect is in the lineup? Okay. If people are picking your guy out at a higher rate, that, that might be a problem, right? Um, if you have a unique feature, like a tattoo on the face or something like that, cover it up. I've worked cases, I swear to God where the witness's description was the guy had a huge neck tattoo. And sure enough, in the lineup, there's only one guy in the lineup with a big-ass neck tattoo, and no one else has a tattoo at all. Who the, who the hell is the witness going to pick other than that guy, right? Like, these are kind of common sense things that it's really easy in our day and age to, to cover that up. You can take Photoshop and remove it or put, you know, a, a blur over there on every person's face in the same spot, and you can take care of that problem. Um, if the suspect was picked because they match a composite or video footage, then you should choose fillers that match um, to the same composite or footage, not the witness's description. Otherwise, this can cause issues. Um, keep a record of how fillers were selected. So if I'm ever hired, um, I can review that and determine if it was appropriate or not. Um, make photos and all other characteristics as similar as possible. I've worked cases where you can ostensibly tell that one of the pictures is way different than the rest because one was a driver's license photo and the rest are mug mugshot photos. And whenever that happens, you can, it, it, my guy stands out like a sore thumb, right? There, well, there's something wrong with this one picture. Why are they different? People might pick that person just because of that and not because of their memory. Okay. Be careful using photos from different sources. Like I just described, um, that creates a problem. Clothing bias is another particular concern, especially with show ups. Clothing bias is the idea that we will, um, witnesses may often pick someone just because they match the description of the clothing, not because they match the memory of the culprit. So anytime there's a show up, this is a, this is a problem because the person's probably wearing the same clothes or they're pulled over or stopped because they match the description and they're wearing similar clothing. So we need to be careful in that case, it'd be best to hide the clothing and not let the witness see the clothing, especially if it's distinctive clothing. If it's just some generic shirt, it's not as big of a deal. Um, but you also don't want to only have one person in the lineup have having the match to clothing and everybody else have on different clothing because that's a problem too. <clears throat> Just make sure the photo the suspect doesn't stand out and and um, you should be okay there. Pre lineup instructions. Um, we've known for decades again here that the police should not just suggest that your job is to pick out the person that um, they believe is a suspect. Um, that they should let you know that there may or may not be someone and the, uh, the, the, the suspect may or may not be present in the lineup. Um, they should be instructed that the administrator does not know which person the suspect might be unless they're using an automated version where that's, that's negated. Um, they should also be given the option of don't know. So it's okay. Um, please keep in mind the person may or may not be present in the lineup. Um, I do not know who the suspect is in the lineup. It is, um, it is okay to say not there. Um, and you're also allowed to say don't know. Um, recent research shows that the don't know response or, or not sure response um, is beneficial and that it reduces false identifications without affecting correct IDs, but there's still a lot more research that needs to be done to, to show that, okay? The premise here is that it removes the assumption that the witness is obliged to choose from the available option. The problem is that if the cops are doing their job, they're gonna pick people or pick a suspect that matches your description. So 
if the cops say pick out the guy that robbed you, now the witness believes that their job is just to pick out the person. They're always going to be able to pick out the best match to their memory because someone is always going to be a good match to their memory. All right. We don't want them choosing because they're assuming the person is in there. We want them only choosing because th that person matches their memory, not because it's the best match to their memory. Okay. So remove some of the pressure away from them. And we can see here, this is just one of the original studies that looked at this, but it's been replicated dozens of times. Uh, and there's meta analyses that show this. Basically, when you give unbiased lineup instructions, it significantly reduces false identifications. It also has a little bit of a, of a hit to correct IDs, but the, the benefit obviously is to, to false IDs much more so than, than the loss in correct IDs. Okay. The sixth recommendation is that when you gather confidence, you need to do so immediately after the identification and um, before any post-identification feedback can be can be given. So here's an example. At lineup, the person might say something like, oh my God, I don't know. It's one of these two, but I don't know. Oh man, the guy was a little bit taller than number two. It's one of those two, but I don't know. I don't know number two. And then if we don't measure their confidence then, and the only time we get their confidence is when they're testifying at trial, which happens all the time, the person, of course, is going to be 100% confident by the time trial comes around because the police have arrested the guy. The DA has charged them. I'm there in court testifying, agreeing to put this person away for many years, right? So, you know, they go from I'm not really sure to I'm 100% positive that's the person. And if we don't have that first objective measurement of confidence, we don't have a way of... <coughs> using that to determine the veracity of their of their statement okay recent research has shown that there it can be a strong relationship between confidence and accuracy if we do things properly then confidence can be a good indicator of accuracy the problem is is that <clears throat> excuse me we can mess up the identification procedure in many ways and when we do that confidence no longer is a postictor of accuracy right and that's the key thing that we use in the legal system to determine whether we should trust a witness or not, jurors use it, defense attorneys, police use it, um, is to determine whether a witness is, is being accurate or not is on their confidence level. And the problem is that confidence is easy, easily um, manipulated, whereas the accuracy has already been done, right? So we, we measure their decision, that determines their accuracy, but then after the fact, we can do all these other things to, to change their, their confidence. But that doesn't lead to a, a concurrent change in their, in their accuracy, obviously. So that's why it's a problem. So we always need that immediate confidence statement. I cannot tell you most cases I work on, they rarely get that immediate one. All I'm, all I have to deal with is the final one. And at that point, you can't use confidence anymore to post stick accuracy because of all these other um, post identification feedback issues that, that occur. Okay. Number seven is that all identification should be recorded. Um, creates a lasting objective record of the ID process. Um, <clears throat> it's a record of the lineup itself, instructions given, linked up process, and post-ID feedback. I had a case recently where they um, had the whole thing recorded as a show up. It was great because I was able to see what the officer was doing during the lineup procedure. And sure enough, what the officer said happened during the lineup did not match up with what actually happened during the lineup. So the officer in this case, was giving inappropriate feedback to the witness, even though they weren't intentionally doing it, they were. And so when I went back and watched the video, I could see that the witness actually never made a positive ID until after the cop prodded and prodded and prodded, and then said, okay, give me what, how, how confident are you? Then at that point, the witness finally made an ID, but again, it, it wasn't, it wasn't um, um, voluntary at that point. So it's a tainted ID. I would never have known that without the video recording. Um, number eight, this one should seem pretty simple, but it, I'm finding this more and more common. And that is the idea of um, avoid repeating IDs. So we'd never want a situation where the same witness is presented with the same suspect in multiple attempts to identify that person. Many areas of science, test retest is a hallmark. It's very good for establishing reliability. Unfortunately, in the situation of an eyewitness identification task, you get one shot at this. You can't unring the bell. So once you show that one witness, that suspect, you can never do it again for obvious reasons because the witness is going to either infer that 
well, the cops keep showing me this guy, even though I've not picked him before, they must have strong evidence that he's the guy. So now I'm going to pick him or they pick him before and they're just going to stay committed to that choice. So they're going to keep picking him. So in, in any case of a repeated ID, you learn nothing from the later identifications. We see this all the time with social media. I see this a lot now where the witness will go and do their own investigation. And they're like, oh, cop, I, I found the guy on, on, on Facebook. This is the guy that stole from my mom, right? Now they put together a lineup and show that person to them. It, it's tainted at that point because they've already seen the person. Um, they see a lineup, but they make no pick or attempt to pick. And then they're showing another lineup with different fillers. Um, photo lineup or show up and then followed up by a live lineup later. Mugshot viewing, you may, cops may bring in a witness and say, look through these mugshots of, of um, other um, uh, convicts who have committed similar crimes. Maybe you'll see the guy in there. And then maybe they don't pick the guy, but then somehow one of those pictures ends up in the lineup later on as their suspect. And they misattribute where they saw the face from, from the mug book, not from the actual crime. Um, courtroom IDs, these drive me nuts. I don't understand them. I wish we could get rid of these altogether, but every case I've ever worked on, I'm sure many of you can, can attest to this, the witness takes a stand, the state's attorney does a big show of, can you identify the person that robbed you in the court? And they point to the guy sitting at the defensive table, how confident are you in that ID? I'm 100% confident. None of that shit matters, part of my language, that tells us nothing about the guilt of the person, because at that point, um, of course, they're going to identify the guy sitting over at the defense table. They're never going to say, no, it's not that guy. Or, you know, it's that guy, but I'm not confident at all it's a guy, right? So um, that's probably the most common form of this, but it really should not be used at all because it's not adding anything to the case other than prejudice. Um, <clears throat> and then lastly, show up recommendation. So overall, in my field, eyewitness researchers will unanimously agree that show ups are not good show-ups are prejudicial pretty much overall, okay? However, we also realize the need for these in actual cases and times that, that we, we are not able to just say, don't ever use them. So what we, we do is we kind of come to a happy medium here where if you're going to use them, please follow the rest of the protocols we just discussed and make them as less prejudiced as possible. So for instance, I've been on cases where the cops show up and the guy's in handcuffs sitting in the back of a cop car and they pull him out and they're like, is this the guy? He's like, of course, you know, everything you have pointing, you've got all these people standing around him. He's in handcuffs. He was in the back of a cop car. All that's pointing that this guy's guilty, right? That you've arrested him. Um, so they should be shown without handcuffs on or, or at least have something covering his wrist so they can't tell their handcuffs on. Don't hold up clothing next to the guy. Often I'll find like, They'll find a jacket and they'll be like, yeah, he was wearing this jacket that that's clothing bias uh, possibly. So do everything you can to make it as, as least prejudiced as possible. Um, but if you can avoid this at all costs, you really get better evidence from a lineup. Um, and the worst thing you could do, and I've worked several cases now that do this is a photographic show up. And there really should never be an excuse for this. So basically the cops take a picture of the guy and then show that picture to the witness. Well, if you have a picture of the guy, make a lineup. Don't show the picture to the person because you don't, you, you know, if you've taken the picture, you, you can make a lineup. Okay. So those are kind of the, the main recommendations that we have. I'm happy to take any questions you have. If you have a specific case that you're working on that you're curious to hear about um, or just anything in general, I'm happy to answer those now. I'll stop sharing too. So. Um, I have one question. Um, it says, has anyone thought to run two lineups with the suspect and one without? So for example, first lineup of five or so individuals and then another setup of five or so with the suspect only appearing in one of the lineups. So that's a really good question. What you're getting at there is what we would call a blank lineup. Um, we wouldn't want to do the situation where we have a lineup where we put the guy in there and then we take him out. And so that's our five person lineup. And we show that to a witness. And then after they view that lineup, we show them another lineup now just with the guy in there, because now that's getting back to like avoiding repeated IDs almost because what's happening is the only new picture is our guy. So the witness might infer that, well, the only new one here is this dude. So that must be the suspect. What you're referring to is what we call a blank lineup, which is where we do a study where 
we show people a lineup full of all fillers first. Then after that lineup, we show them the real lineup or we show them an actual lineup with the culprit in it. What we find in that research is that people who choose from the blank lineup are less accurate from follow-up subsequent lineups, which makes sense. So it's actually a really good screening procedure and you get better diagnosticity ratios, meaning you gain more evidence basically um, from folks who um, choose from a later lineup who rejected the first one than from people who chose at both lineups. Um, the problem with this, applying this in the real world is that eventually it only works if people don't know what we're tricking them, right? So like once people learn that this is the procedure of how it works, then that first lineup would be meaningless. Does that make sense? Um, but it is, it is something that we've researched and, and it has shown promise. It's just, oh, uh, I would say overcoming that one major hurdle of if we could just fool people and not let them know that this is happening every time, then it would, it would be a useful reform. Great. Thank you. So we're at time. Um, I want to thank Dr. Cahill for coming, for coming on and sharing his, his expertise and his time with us this evening. We really appreciate um, all you, all your um, insights. It's been great. Um, I want to thank everyone else for attending. It's been a great, thank you for joining us on the webinar. Um, stay tuned for February and March. February, we're going to be talking about effective legal writing and March we'll talk about investing in yourself. So again, thank you all. Um, hope you have a great night. Um, thank you, Dr. Cahill. This was awesome. And I'm, I'm happy to stay after if anybody has questions or wants to chat or you can give them my email if they, if they have a case they want to talk to me about. I'm happy to do that. Great. Um, we'll post, I'll get the email and, and get it out to the participants through the okay, cool. executive office. Okay, Great. awesome. Thank, Thank you so much, everybody. No problem. Have a good night. Have a good night. <laughs>